1 Samuel chapter 17, go ahead and find your place, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to be uh, there this morning for uh, today's message as we're in this series uh, through the summer on the names of God, the attributes of his character. As you're finding your place, let me just echo uh, a couple of things that have already been uh, spoken this morning. I am extremely thankful for all of our leadership team that was here this weekend uh, all of our youth leadership team that served their face off to make sure that CY Weekend was a tremendous success and, and students met with Christ. And, you know, in this time, we can either find an excuse to do nothing or we can do something. Amen. And we could have figured out a way to, to try and do. We, we did our dead level best under the anointing of what God has called us to do as a church to meet the needs of students to have a, a summer experience this year that uh, allowed them an opportunity to connect, uh, connect with Christ in a supernatural way. And I'm thankful for Pastor Marshall and Madeline, and I'm thankful for their leadership team. And I just want you to show, their, show your appreciation for them and put your hands together. I just want to recognize them and just say we are thankful and we appreciate them. I mean, the worship team, the youth worship team did a great job. And, um, and the adult leaders that were here serving through the weekend did, did a phenomenal job. And uh, Weston Weaver, one of our old youth pastors, came back and brought the house down. It's just an incredible time. And I had the opportunity to close out the uh, CY weekend. And, you know, I get a chance to preach youth camps and, and travel and do some youth conference stuff still, even as I'm becoming an older guy. Uh, I realized that youth pastors kind of, um, uh, they have this knack for you know, getting up and doing the silly things. I probably used to do them, and I felt like they're silly. They're like, I was watching, I was like, oh, oh, my goodness, and they start doing that. All the kids start laughing. I'm like, they can laugh. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so maybe I've matured. I don't know. I doubt it. But, uh, but maybe I just never had enough rhythm to do stuff like that. I don't know. So we, we just went after God in a way and, and really feel like uh, it was a profitable weekend. And I want to say thank you to everyone that is in the house and everyone's watching online. Thank you for your faithfulness throughout this season to be faithful to God's house and giving and faithful so that we can still do everything that God's called us to do. And without your faithfulness and without the Lord laying on your heart to be faithful to what he has blessed you with, I'm so grateful to you and for you for, uh, for partnering with us to be able to carry out the vision that God has given the house. You know, through this season, so many different things as a leader, you, you try to make the right calls and do the right things and and the truth of it is, is none of us at any level have, have led during a pandemic of this nature, but I can tell you this, we're going to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit and, his, and God's wisdom and his leadership to do what we feel like is best, and I'm thankful that we are still able to see God move in mighty ways around the world and here in our communities and to be faithful to see him restore families and to be able to see him uh, restore broken lives. It's, it, the church can shine its finest moments in the world's darkest hours, amen? And we have a chance to do that. So we're thankful for you. I know that it's important for us to understand who God is because when we understand who God truly is, it will change the approach in how we see our life. When we know who he is, then we can learn how to act. We can learn how to respond. We can learn what we need to say, how we need to walk, how we need to serve. All of those, when we, had, when we learn the names of God, we're truly learning the attributes of his character. And the one thing that we've learned already through this summer is that God is faithful and God is in control. Over and over and over throughout the Old Testament, from the, the creation account to the opportunity that God provided a ram in the bush for Abraham and Isaac as Abraham was being tested. You see the faithfulness of God, even when it didn't make sense. You see that God is faithful and he is in control. We are able to understand that throughout the massive exodus that God provided for his people under the leadership of a less than stellar leader that had a speech impediment, that he was given an excuse for why he couldn't. God said, you just tell him I am that I am has sent you. He learned something about the authority of the name of God. And we see that carried out through scripture. 
God is faithful. God is in control. God is desiring to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things throughout the face of the earth in which he has given us the opportunity to partner and be an answer to the problem that the world is facing. The attributes of his character revealed through his names that we are learning And we have to also learn that if God's character and his attributes are something that we are to take on, we also have to understand and accept the fact that there is a real adversary, that the enemy creates a counterfeit for every truth that God represents and that God is. The enemy desires to steal, to kill, to destroy. We have to accept the fact that the enemy throughout history knows the weakness of the flesh of humanity. And the traps and the snares that he has laid is consistently placed before you and before me. And the truth of it is, is if we're left to our own devices, we're not going to be able to withstand the day of temptation. Why? Because in our humanity, we are weak. But in the power of God and representing and learning and knowing and embracing the power of his name and attributing the qualities and the character that God has in our life, we can overcome as well. Just like everything that we've read, this is not just a book that we read and go, man, that was a great story. It is for life application. It is transformational. What it can do to a life that is broken, that needs redeemed and needs restored and needs positioned for the greatness of what he's called you and I to do. We have to learn that the enemy is studying game film. Preparing an agenda and strategy to try to get us to go where we wouldn't never normally go and do things we would never have dreamed of doing to paralyze us in fear or to get us sidetracked, even doing good things. But his goal is to keep us from doing what is God's best. What is the destiny and victory in which you and I have been created for? He wants to rob. Why? Because that's who he is. If you've learned anything, you should have learned this, that you're learning who God is. And if you're learning who God is, you're also learning who the enemy is and what he's coming to do. John 10, 10, right? The enemy comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus came that you might have life and have it to the full. When you... Take on the qualities and the character of God. It's transformational to the way that we approach life. And I believe the stories that we read are not just stories to be a good read and we move on from that. They're they're to become transformational in our life so that we can become the men and women of God he has called us to be. An army. An army that is willing to engage in battle and watch God bring the victory. 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a, if you've been in church for any season at all, it's a familiar story. Now, I was 19 years old whenever I came to Christ, and I'd heard the comparison or the analogy of a David versus Goliath and the fact that David was small and Goliath was big. And I'd heard it in sports uh, comparisons and illustrations that way, but I, I really didn't know the story. And so when I first became a Christian, not growing up in church, not knowing biblical stories, the pastor would preach messages and he'd say, oh, you know. And I'm like, no, I don't know. Tell me. I wanted to know. I wanted to hear like, man, I mean, this sounds really awesome. Like God's going to use a little shepherd boy to conquer the enemy that the army was unwilling to engage. I mean, tell me more. Tell me. I want to I learn. I'm all ears. And I think sometimes because we grew up in and around it and we maybe it's just and by and large the church as a whole. That sometimes we just assume that we know the end of the story without ever living out the fact of what the story represents. We just say, oh yeah, he did this. But we don't understand that those stories are to breed in us an expectation for the greatness of what God can do in my life and in your life. That God has positioned you, God has created you, and God desires to use you. Here's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 33. Saul replies to David. He says, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. 
And he has been a warrior from his youth. Let me tell you something. This is for free, just a side note. The reason David wasn't fearful is because he understood he wasn't going in his own authority. He understood the one who was in control of his life. Why? Because he knew that if a God from heaven would pick him to be the next king over Israel when he could have picked better options, he knew that if that God was faithful, that he would be faithful to him then. He understood. He's like, uh, I think there's kind of this moment where David's saying, yeah, you're just going about this all wrong, king. But he wasn't going to say that, so he didn't seem egotistical or arrogant. He just had to listen to the fleshly leadership of a so-called God-appointed leader. Well, you can't do that. I mean, we have our best warriors that are trained for this kind of combat, and we haven't been able to engage. Can you imagine the doubt that is being spoken over his life? It's nothing new for David, by the way. David understood something that they had forgotten, that he wasn't going alone. And then David said to Saul in verse 34, your servant has been keeping the father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. Struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. You understand that whenever the enemy defies the armies of the living God, it's not an attack against them. It's an attack against the one who is positioned and called them. It was deeper for him than just a trash-talking giant that was arrogant and egotistical from past victories. It was personal, but he also understood it to be spiritual. He said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. He also is saying in this moment, if God was with me then, why would God not be with me now? Now, I'm sure that the giant, I mean, the word of God lists for us the, the physical stature of this man. The bronze, the, the, the shield, the sword, the javelin, all the armor bearer that goes before him lists all of these things out for us to understand. But sometimes we don't embrace the description of the story because we already know the end of the story. And we forget that there's an incredible lesson to learn the attribute and the character and the quality of God's name represented through this story to know that we are not called to just listen to the trash talk of the enemy and strike fear in our hearts. We're called to engage in the battle prepared for the season that God has for us. David was saying, God has been preparing me for this moment. Every test that you face in your situation in life if you will ask for the wisdom of God, you can learn that your past challenges that God brought you through was only setting you up for the challenge that is to come. Why? Because the enemy is committed to the destructiveness of your life. If he can't get you today, he'll still try tomorrow. And he'll lull you to sleep by allowing you to do good things instead of being someone great for God. He will allow you to do that so that you will miss the mark and what he's truly called you for. David's saying, look, every battle that I had in the pasture was preparation for the battle line. The things that I did when no one else was looking has prepared me for this moment when everybody else is going to see it. And guess what? The God of heaven, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, yes, that God, Jehovah, he was with me then and he will not fail me now. If you think about the confidence that it has for a young man in his teenage years, in the company of seasoned warriors, 
still not downplaying them. He didn't say anything about the individuals that were there. I wish that he would have said, Saul, why? King Saul, why? Why do you even have these guys here? They are weak. They, they're scared to death. They are wimps in the sight. You need a strong, mighty man of God like me. I mean, I slap lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. You, you just need me to come and set the standard. Saul, call on your boy David. I'm here. I will, I will cut everybody up. I will, you, I will I slap Goliath. I talk about he, did, he didn't downplay it. He didn't make himself better by putting everyone else down. He stayed committed to the facts of the truth of what was to understand the truth of what was going to be. Saul says to him, go and the Lord be with you. Now, why is it that Saul had enough faith to say that to David, but he didn't position any of his other warriors in that moment to say the same? But then something interesting happens in the next part of the story. He says, Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. And David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried to walk around because he was not used to them. He said, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch of the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, approached the Philistine. Why did he have five? Well, look, it's not really clear why it was five. I could come up with all kinds of creative ways to make you like, oh, well, I've never heard that before. But here's what, I've, here's what I've figured out. If you've never heard it before and it's not really in there, then I probably shouldn't try and wow you with something that's not in there. <laughs> but since we're just talking, I would say that one of, the, one of the things is don't ever go into battle underprepared. David had more than, he's like, hey, if I got to hit him one time or I got to hit him five times, I'm committed. <laughs> I'm going to throw my best shot, but I got another one coming after that. It was being committed to see it through. Loaded up with what he had been fighting with. It's important to understand too, this is for free. This isn't even the main part of the message, just, just as we're talking this morning. Stop trying to fight the battle that the enemy is waging with you in someone else's armor? Stop trying to dress up in somebody else's shield. Stop trying to dress up in somebody else's armor. Stop trying to fight with someone else's sword. God wants to equip you for the battle. And guess what? In a fight, you will only succeed in what you have practiced with. Why? Because it's what God has used to prepare you. I remember early on as a, as a believer, going to prayer meeting. We had this thing called intercessory prayer before service. It was before really churches had multiple services and it was the common thing and, and the norm. So if service was at 1045, Sunday school was at 915. We had intercessory prayer at, um, at I think 845 or nine o'clock. And I would go in there and you know, it wasn't a long time of prayer. But you know, as a new Christian, I mean, it didn't take me long to have intercessory prayer. Lord, I want you to move in this service today. May we get everything we have for you. In Jesus' name, amen. That was about 20 seconds if I stretched it long. If I said it real spiritual, like, Lord, I need you to move today. Would you just speak to our lives? I mean, there wasn't much, but there were people in there that prayed like they knew God. Like they prayed, and I... I would quit praying. Like, I didn't know what else to pray, so I just agree with them. Amen. What, what she said, Lord. Yes. That's so good. And here's the thing. They used words that I really didn't understand. Lord, would you justify and sanctify and position us as you've restituted? I'm like, whatever that means, I'm down. I want that. And what I was learning, what I'm learning, and what I learned through that moment is God doesn't expect you to engage in battle with something that's disingenuine to you. He would rather you fight with what you know so that he can grow you in what you can be. You say, well, does God put me in a battle that he knows I'm not going to win? No, God prepares you for a battle he knows you're going to win because you're not fighting for the victory, you're fighting from the victory. 
Because as a child of the Most High King, he's not going to send you into a battle that you're going to surely lose for the embarrassment of his name. He's going to send you into a battle and give you an opportunity so that his name remains great and that everyone will know that there is a God in heaven. Don't fight. Don't fight in somebody else's armor. There's so many kids that are trying to fight in their mom and daddy's armor, trying to fight on a prayer that was prayed for them by someone. Until you own it, until it's yours, until you embrace it, don't you even walk out onto the battlefield. It says in 41, meanwhile, the Philistine with a shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. And he looked David over and he saw he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. And he despised him. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Now, look, I don't know how good trash talking, if they had a 101 trash talking course in the Old Testament, but this is an attack of who David's appearance is, an attack, and also an attack of the God that he represents. And he's saying, do you consider me? I have called for your best and this is your best. I will, I will conquer you and I will feed your flesh to the birds and the animals. And David said to the Philistine, without, he without hesitation, he said, you come against me with the sword and the spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, Jehovah Sabah. I come at you. I don't come in my own name. I don't come in my own authority. I don't come in my own power. I come at you in the name of the Lord Almighty. He said, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And the very day I will give you the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all of those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. See, the battle wasn't just with Goliath. It was for the complete mission. And as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching in his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it, struck the Philistine in the forehead and the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. He ran over and stood over him, took out the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When I first became the pastor here, I had an opportunity to do devotion for the high school football team. And I always figured if I was going to do something else in my life, I'd want to coach. Does that feel, I don't know, it's just fun. Sometimes, depending on the officiating. And, and I remember going in that first morning. We, we got there at like 4.30, 5 o'clock. started cooking in the kitchen, breakfast for the team. The team shows up, and they're eating. And one of the coaches at the time that was on staff, or the coaching staff, um, still in the church here, but I don't know if they're coaching there anymore, but had kind of connected me with the head coach there to have the opportunity to speak. And he comes to me right before. He says, hey, you only got five minutes? I said, I only need to. And I told this story about David cutting off the head of the giant, talking about the preparation. And, and it was, look, I mean, it was, you go and you cut the enemies, leave no doubt, you know, and they're like, yeah. Because I'm sure they've been like, look, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. And there are seven things you need to know about victory in games. And it's not about the score, but oh, well, why are we playing? I'm so, why are you telling me to quit? I'm just communicating. There is... <laughs> I mean, I don't go to battle unless I think I'm going to win. <laughs> if I'm going to lose, I'm going to save everybody some time. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I think they won the game. Now, that didn't go so well for another team I shared that with in, in central Arkansas, but it's not my job to, to fight it. It's my job to encourage them. He left no doubt. And here's what I know from this story is that the army of Israel had become an army by title only. Why is it that this army is there representing the God of Israel and this Philistine, this uncircumcised, this, this individual who has no covenant with the God of heaven? Why is it that they are allowing him to come out and defy this army? The people that God has been faithful to over and over and over. Why wasn't there this 
this feeling, this overwhelming feeling of, of I've had all I can stand and I can't stand it anymore. And whether I die or I live, I'm going to die on the battleground defying this enemy who's defying my God. I cannot live this way anymore. David, just a little shepherd boy, still not the king, still not been positioned, but yes, anointed, who his dad didn't even send him to battle, but sent him to take supplies. He was just the cheese carrier for his brothers. Here's what the enemy's doing, what the Philistine giant's saying. He's like, hey, is there not a cause? What will be done for the man that overcomes this enemy? They described, he said, I- I'll go, I'll do it. His brothers were jealous and said, see, you've come out here to make a show. You want to you be the center of attention. You, he's like, what, what can I, I can't do anything right. I'm criticized for staying home. I'm criticized for not coming to the park. God, they knew what no one else knew, that he had been anointed by Samuel, the prophet, to be the next king. And he's coming up just to bring supplies. He was coming to bring a report back to his dad. He wasn't going and saying, Lord, I'm going I'm to whoop the giant. He didn't even know there was a giant there. But when he approached the battlefield and he learned these these lessons it was overwhelming to him that i cannot stand back and do nothing listen to me he understood something about jehovah sama the lord a mighty warrior he understand that god's name covers all of it the past moments with lions and, and bears to the present moment with a giant. And you see in David's life, he had to return to the mighty warrior of who God is to overcome his personal struggles. You learn how to fight in the different seasons of your life and the giant isn't always screaming from a a big stature across the field. Sometimes it sneaks into the private parts of your life that no one else even sees. He's learned in that moment that the name of God was enough for past was enough for his present, and he would have to rely on it again in his future. Because giants rear their ugly heads from time to time. And we have to trust that God is bigger than the giant of the moment of where we are. See, listen to me. A giant has a way of intimidating us at such a deep level that we end up doing nothing. Look, we know what that's like. To know that there is a challenge that is extremely difficult. So instead of engaging the challenge, we just do nothing and hope it works out. We pray, God, would you send someone? And God's saying, look, I let you recognize it, so I'm calling you. He's saying, Lord, I know my marriage is struggling, but maybe if you'll send someone to speak a word. He's like, no, I spoke a word to you. Get your junk together. Let me redeem and restore, and I will rebuild what has been destroyed. We always will push the pressure of the moment when we're not engaged in the battle that we should be. We will try and push it and defer to someone else. Let me tell you something. The battles that God is calling you to face, he's calling you to face. Stop relying on someone else to do it because God wants to be great in and through you. I just don't feel like I can. It's not about what you feel. It's about who he is. See, the power of who God is will change our perspective. Listen to me. David had a perspective that included the spiritual realm that superseded the natural of what was obvious to that army. See, when David countered Goliath's mockery, he didn't do it by saying, look, I mean, I got a pretty good slingshot. I got five stones, man. I hit you five different times. If it don't kill you, it'll sting really bad. He didn't say, he didn't say anything. He He just simply understood in the perspective of of, of who God had called him to be and who God is. He uh, he combated the mockery of Goliath's words by announcing that he had the Lord of hosts, the mighty warrior of Israel on his side, whereas Goliath did not. See, David saw the spiritual reality behind the social issue. Isn't it amazing? That we can't see past the physical into the spiritual, but everything that you see in the physical is a manifestation of something that has taken place in the spiritual. The armies of Israel were struggling because they weren't committed to the purpose that they were created for, representing the one who created them. 
It was a shift in perspective. See, there, the army's perspective focused on Goliath's physical stature, but David's perspective was focused on the power of God. Perspective is a powerful thing, amen? See, perspective is never just what you see. Perspective is how you view what you see. Perspective is a key of how we can gain in knowing and applying the character of God's name in order to live the abundant life that God has called us to. It's not just what you see, it's what you think about what you see. It's the opinion that you gather from what you have surveyed. It's not about what you do, it's what you think about what you do. David said, it's not physical only, it's spiritual. I will not allow this non-covenant having bully to come against my king, my true king, my God. And David understood something that we can learn this morning through the name of God that he spoke. And Jehovah Sabah, he says, for us, we can gain the understanding that we have to give our battles to God. See, David understood God was supreme over the situation and he informed Goliath that the Lord would deliver him into his hands and David did not abdicate his personal responsibility. He didn't sub it out. He didn't push it to someone else. He said, I will own this. I will because if the Lord has allowed me to see it, then the Lord has called me to it. But the American church is very popular for spotting a problem without having a solution. It doesn't take talent to spot a problem. It takes anointing to make a difference. And David trusted God for the victory. He said, the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. He understood that it wasn't just a personal victory, it was a corporate victory. That the personal engagement of which he conquered the giant would bring victory to all of the people in God's army, all of God's people. The individual battles that you will engage of this giant that is standing across the field in your life, shouting and hurling insults at you, when you win that battle, it also releases the supernatural in other people's lives as well. That if God could give you the victory, that God's no respecter of persons and what God has done for them, what God has done for him, what God has done for you, he could do for someone else. If you've ever been bound by a giant of addiction and God sets you free, do you think that you're the only one God ever desired to deliver? No, God wants to deliver a whole mess of people. And maybe the battle in which you engage and show God to be faithful is the victory needed to absolutely catapult someone off of the couch and into the, in, in encountering the battle. It's stepping out, stepping up, and being faithful. Your engagement, you're in the rules of engagement of spiritual battle. It gives us an opportunity to build faith for what God can do. And if I know anything, I know this, that I don't have to take much time to talk about how the enemy hurls insults at God's people. See, the one thing that you don't need me to over explain this morning is how the enemy has shouted at you individually. There's not one of you under the sound of my voice and watching online this morning that has not had the enemy scream in a voice that no one else could hear at you individually that you weren't enough, that you weren't gonna make it, that you couldn't overcome this and that everyone knew you were fake, that everyone knew you were phony. Can I tell you that there has to come a time in your life in my life, where we say, I've had all I can stand, and I will not stand for it anymore. I will be God's warrior for this moment. And guess who receives the benefit? You do. I've never met an addict that's been delivered that said, man, I mean, it's been good having my family restored, being sober for all these years. But I just, I miss the mornings I woke up not knowing where I was. Covered in my own vomit. I I miss those embarrassing moments when I woke up in jail. I miss my picture, being in the newspaper with local arrests. I just, I miss breaking the heart of my spouse. I I, I wish, I I just miss lying to my, I've never heard someone back up and say that. 
Why? Because when God gives you the victory, it only catapults you for a moment that is coming. Embrace the now where the giant is screaming at you. Engage. Engage in the battle. Engage the giants that's screaming in our lives. Now, well, pastor, what do you want me to do? I'm glad you asked. Write this down if you're taking notes. In this battle, if Jehovah Sabah, the, the Lord, the mighty warrior, the Lord of hosts, if he's going to be your leader and your guide, and here's what we have to do to engage. Number one, give us the discernment to detect. What are we detecting? Here's what we're detecting. We're detecting the lies that are in contrast with the truth of God that the enemy shouts at us. We're gonna detect the suggestions that are in contrast to the commands that God has given. We're gonna get detect what is the temptations from the enemy that is in total contrast with the promises of God. We're gonna be wise. We're gonna be wise to see his plans that are failing. The purpose and the agenda that is futile and the position of that enemy that is fraudulent. Listen to me, as a child of the Most High King, the enemy can have no authority over your life that you don't give to him. The devil can't make you do anything. The devil made me do it as a cop-out for not owning up to personal responsibility. Now, do I believe the devil was behind some of the actions? Absolutely. The Lord of hosts will give us the discernment. Number two, then we gotta get dressed for battle. Why? Because God hasn't left us defenseless for this. He's provided us with protective armor. Therefore, we have to choose to stand against the devil's schemes and to keep on standing. And we've done all we can to stand. We're going to stand some more. We're going to choose to armor up in the armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and it is coming if it's not already here, that we may be able to stand on the ground that God is giving us to continue standing firm. And when we put it on, the armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, that our feet are ready to take the gospel of peace into a world at war with the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, we're going to be dressed for battle. We no longer have to search for our weapons because we're ready for the battle. Because we understand that we could be called in for duty at any moment. You're like, Pastor, I came to church this morning because I just want to feel good. Oh, you're going to feel good when you leave. Because you're going to understand that God gives his people the assured victory. If you have not learned anything else throughout this series, know this. God is faithful and God doesn't fail his people. What is there to fear? Then fear itself. Now we should, if we have a fear, let it be a healthy fear that we don't want to fail God in the moment he is aligned for us to be counted as faithful. That we engage in the battle. That we, and then when the enemy begins, we're going to pursue and conquer this sucker. We're not going to let him get away. Just we want to settle the issue for once and for all. Why? Because the destructiveness the destructiveness of the launch that he has, has put an attack against God's house, against God's people, against the children of the king is destroying families. It's destroying churches. Instead of being a leader, it's creating critics. We got to get dressed for battle. We got to recognize, we got to discern, we got to be dressed, we got to discern when the enemy is trying to come in like a flood that we can have the standard of Jesus Christ that rises up against these moments. We're discerning, we're getting dressed, but we also have to be committed that we will not fight in our own power. Come on, stand with me this morning if you're able all across this room. If you're watching online at home and you want to stand, please, by all means, do.
make a commitment that if we're going to be the children of God, that we will not fight in our own power because it is limited. But we serve an unlimited God whose funnel is as big from the, from the port of heaven to the ground of which we receive it. Let's don't limit an unlimited God. That we will not fight in our own power. That we understand since we're fighting invisible forces of evil, giants that scream from the shadows of our life. That we don't wage war with conventional weapons. That we understand that we're not fighting in our own natural ability, but we're fighting with spiritual weapons that have power to demolish Satan's strongholds. That he's given us the sword of the Spirit, which is his word. He's given us prayer, and we're going to keep reading and applying and obeying and loving and sharing the Word of God while we also keep praying until heaven is moved and our nation and our churches are changed and until His return comes or He takes us home. Then we're going to fight under God's supernatural power because the Word teaches us that our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If we're saying that the battle will not be won by our might or our power, but by the Spirit of the Lord who lives within us, the Lord of heaven, the mighty conqueror, the Lord of hosts, that we're asking Him to saturate us with His Spirit, with His holiness, with His purity, with His righteousness, with his justice with his power with his mercy with his grace and with his love covered by his blood and the courage to call out the devil when we hear his mocking taunting threatening right divisive insinuating accusations that we say he is a liar he is a roaring lion but the lord of heaven the mighty warrior of heaven has positioned us to engage and have the victory our not our power but his his power because he is the Lord, our warrior. Stand. Stand in this moment. Stand in this season. Stand and notice what the enemy is saying and call out the lies of the enemy. Engage that giant. Engage the giant. Don't hesitate for another moment. Don't hesitate for another moment of your life. Look, you can't go into battle in your own strength. So if you're, if you're here this morning or watching online, all you have to do is surrender your life 100% to Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, take who I am and everything I'm not and save me, deliver me. Be my king, be my Lord. And God will do it. Jesus, the mighty warrior of heaven, he will save you. And when he saves you, you're enlisted in the army to go to battle. Let's go to battle. Let's go to battle for the kingdom's cause. It's not our personal cause. It's not a political cause. It's not, it's not a popularity cause. It's, it's a kingdom. It's a spiritual cause. We're going to engage the darkness of this world. We're going to engage, we're going to engage in it because we can win. Don't let fear strike your heart. Don't let fear grip your heart to where you're no longer willing to engage. You'd rather take a back row and watch somebody else fight. It doesn't matter how old or how young or how long or how seasoned you may have been serving. It's time. It is time for the sleeping giant of the American church to rise to its authority and its power. George Barna's research shows that 33% of churchgoers that were French will not return after this pandemic ceases because they've learned another way of life. Can I tell you, it's time for the church. It's time for God's people to stand up and stand proud, to stand counted as the warriors of a kingdom that is suffering violence. And we say the violent are going to take it by force, that we can be men of God, women of God, warriors for the cause of Christ so that we can make a difference in our world. Let's don't let this giant keep shouting at us. Let's shout back with the truth of God, not in our own strength or ability, but with the power of God, obvious in our life. May we be suited for this battle for his purpose, for his kingdom. April, would you come and pray for us? We're doing things a little different during this season. And I believe that this room and watching online, you can have just one altar moment where you are. Seal the deal today. Whether it's becoming a Christian, if you get saved today and you pray that prayer, what I mentioned, all if you will please let us know. We want to help get you suited for battle. We want to walk, we want to link arms with you and connect with you so we can encourage you in the steps. It's the greatest decision you've ever made. We want to see you win. We together can win this battle when we learn how to fight individually. God before us, He's more than the world against us. The 
word that just keeps rolling around in my mind over and over is just preparation. And I feel like preparation can mean something different to every single one of us because we're all at a different place in our walk and in our life. But preparation is the word. So when you go out of this place today, that's the word that I hope is on your heart. Preparation for the battle that's coming. Preparation now for the thing that you don't know is coming. Preparation now for a battle that you couldn't even see happening or coming. Let's pray together that God would equip us and give us everything that we need to be prepared for the battle that we're gonna encounter. Father, you are faithful. You are faithful. Your word is so faithful to speak to the very heart of the issue. And God, I pray today for every single person under the sound of my voice. Father, I pray God now that they would begin to prepare just like David did in the quiet and in the secret. God, I pray, Lord, that the specific and individual way that you have called them to fight, that you would prepare them now. God, I pray that they wouldn't grow weary in preparing in darkness, in preparing in the quiet season, in preparing in the, in the quiet times when others don't see it. But God, I pray, Lord, that they would see that every step that they take and every small battle that they face now is equipping them for the great battle, to, to present them as the warrior in the battle that you've called them to. God, help to prepare our hearts. Lord, we can't be weak and weary Christians in a time like this. God, we need to be full of your spirit. We need to be full of your word. And I pray that every person here today, Lord, would take it as their personal stand to be prepared, to be so full of you and so full of your Holy Spirit that they know the battle is in front of them and that they are just like David to say, who is this? Who is this that he would stand against our God? Lord, let us unite together and be equipped to battle for you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.